Welcome to the MIA Part 2 module on Advanced Hodograph Interpretation. I'm Pete Wolf, the Science and Operations Officer at the Jacksonville Forecast Office. The objectives of this module are to review the basics on hodographs, understand what changing the hodograph length and concavities mean with regard to pressure perturbations and how this can affect convective storm structure, mode, and intensity, understand how the changing hodograph shape and changing storm motion vector can affect the pattern of storm relative flow vectors and why this can influence storm structure, mode, and intensity, and to interpret how small-scale environment changes can affect the hodograph and thus how small errors can affect accurate environment interpretation. This module focuses on the application of the hodograph in operations. To understand the why and the how regarding this, you'll be asked to complete four additional sub-module videos in YouTube that are related to this one. These represent segments from a presentation from Dr. Ariel Cohen. The combination of all of these plus this module will probably require about two hours to complete, but it's important not to shortchange this within a shorter module. So complete the full module as it is set up. When you reach a sub-module video, you'll enter the link URL in a different browser to view that YouTube video, then return to this presentation. So a key point with regard to the motivation for this module is that this is one of the most valuable tools for the meteorologist to understand what is going on through the troposphere and what is likely to influence sensible weather. This concept of the vertical wind profile and how it appears on the hodograph. Why is this important? Because there's no coincidence with the wind. Patterns of wind and shear and changes to those patterns in time and space mean something. Something is occurring in the troposphere that could influence convection. Here we see an example from a long ago wind profiler, when we had wind profilers, showing how quickly environment can change in time and space. You see somewhat different changes in the pattern of speed and directional shear hour by hour. Here we have another example. This one shows a frontal surface moving across the area and we see the slope of the front and the deepening of cold air behind it hour by hour. We also see the change in the vertical wind shear hour by hour ahead of the approaching front. So vertical wind profiles and hodographs tell us a lot about how the structure of vertical shear is changing, even as quickly as hour to hour. Here again, we see the frontal boundary. We also see some wind maximums as well uh, that may reflect weak waves, even shallow ones in the lower atmosphere. True or false, an image of zero to three kilometer storm relative velocity gives us a full picture of the level of streamwise vorticity that could be ingested into a developing thunderstorm updraft. I hope you answered this false because it is false. It's only close to accurate for a right deviating storm motion and accurate hodograph length and shape. The SRH value that you see on these plots is usually not valid for initial storm development that is not turned to the right. And it's also not valid for a left deviating storm or in situations when the hodograph contains error. So even small changes to the hodograph or to the storm motion vector used can lead to substantial changes to SRH. A key point is that because of the variable hodograph displays that relate to a given level of shear or SRH in a plan view plot, it's important not to just focus on that number. Look at the hodograph to see what the number means for a given time and location. So here we see an example with a zero to three kilometer SRH and we have X marked where we have a value of 250. Well, what does that mean? It can mean a variety of things. It can mean a variety of different hodograph shapes. Here are four examples of hodographs and storm motion vectors that give us about 250 for SRH. But as you see, they can mean very different end results. The upper left probably favorable for a tornadic storm. The upper right is likely not favorable given very weak storm relative flow where we have that loop in the hodograph in the inflow layer. The lower right actually may favor a left moving storm over a right mover and so forth. So you have to look at the hodograph and see the actual shape and the concavities that represent the vertical shear in the atmosphere. So never trust a single value alone. And again, this value is based on a 25 to 30 knot easterly wind, as you see in the vectors. That's for a right moving storm. That's not for the initial storm motion. So also never assume a value of SRH 
is based on the exact storm motion vector. Changing motion vectors can change things like SRH as well as storm relative flow vectors. In this example, we see three photographs, all producing an, uh, a 0 to 3 kilometer SRH of 250, but with different motion vectors giving us a different pattern of storm relative flow. The left photograph represents pretty strong storm relative flow aloft to distribute precipitation down shear away from the updraft, whereas the right photograph shows much weaker storm relative flow aloft that might keep the precipitation within or very close to the updraft core. So photographs are a very important tool for the mesoanalyst for understanding how shear is changing in time and space. It helps us understand not only the pattern of shear, but also the pattern of storm relative flow with height. So each shear vector, such as in the orange example, basically connects the ends of the to tops of two wind vectors, representing the bottom and top of a given layer. The lowest three kilometers, the inflow layer, if you will, is shown in red. And so given the storm motion vector to the right, right, right moving storm, the green arrows represent storm relative flow within the inflow layer, or storm relative inflow. Whereas the blue arrows represent storm relative flow further aloft. How is it going to distribute precipitation further aloft relative to the updraft core? So a key point is that some environment changes and what they represent can appear more clearly on the hodograph than they can on the vertical wind profile. And I'm going to show you some examples. Take a look at this vertical wind profile. Would you say that's a favorable profile for tornadoes? After all, we have a strong veering of wind and an increase in wind with height overall, pretty strong shear both in terms of direction and height. However, believe it or not, this is not a favorable profile for tornadoes. And there's a key reason why, which is very subtle on the vertical wind profile, but it sticks out on the hodograph. And we see the loop in the uh, upper part of the inflow layer, loop in the hodograph, right near where the storm motion vector is, meaning you have almost no storm relative flow through that particular part of the inflow layer. You're not going to be able to move precipitation down shear. It's going to build up in the updraft. Hard to get a rapidly intensifying updraft to support vortex stretching and acceleration when you have a lot of precipitation stuck within the updraft core. This is an example where you may end up getting a core of up to maybe 20, 25,000 feet, where normally you would expect a core up to 35, 40,000 feet because of the precipitation within the updraft. This is a less favorable photograph for tornadoes compared to one that does not have that loop, that small area of weakening winds in the top part of the, up, of the inflow layer. You can't see that very easily on the vertical wind profile. How about this wind profile? Is it favorable for tornadoes? Again, you have some veering of wind at low levels and pretty strong speed shear with height. However, if you look at this in the hodograph, you get this. You get uh, an opposite curvature of the hodograph in the inflow layer that actually would be more supportive of the left mover. Might be more favorable for very large hail and not for a longer tracked right mover with a tornado threat. So you have to look at the hodograph, not just the wind profile alone. It's much easier to see these changes in shear on the hodograph than just simply looking at the vertical wind profile. So the mesoanalyst needs to be focused on the hodograph and hodograph changes in time and space, which can be substantial, as much as for any other tool. So lack of or improper use of the hodograph, just as with the skew T, can lead to erroneous environment conclusions from the mesoanalyst. This is a fascinating uh, radar animation, and what it illustrates is rapid environment change in time and space, leading to different end results. We have a forward propagating MCS across Oklahoma and eastern Texas. We have back building convection early on in Arkansas. We have training convection that sets up after the MCS in uh, south central Oklahoma late in this animation. Just a variety of different things occurring based on different types of environments. So initially when you have a storm develop, and let's say you have a photograph that looks like this, it's a pretty straight line, the motion vector initially will be very close to or on the photograph. And that means you don't have a lot of stream-wise vorticity. All the uh, storm relative flow vectors are basically almost parallel with each other with height, basically pointing towards the southwest down low and towards the north and northeast up high. The end result of this is if you've got a football flying through this environment, instead of spiraling, 
it would move like this. This is referred to as crosswise vorticity. And when this is ingested into an updraft core, the rotation is not co-located with the core of the updraft, but rather located on the edges of the updraft. And you can get rotational signatures, but they're not co-located with the updraft, where you would have the stretching of the vortex, as you will. For that, we need streamwise vorticity. So if the motion vector instead of at A it was actually at B, off the hodograph curve, then we have a very pattern of storm relative flow vectors. And in this environment, the football would spiral. And as it gets ingested into the updraft, that rotation would be co-located with the core of the updraft. Now we're in for business as far as a tornado. We have the rotation co-located with the updraft that can then allow for vortex stretching as the updraft accelerates. Okay, it's time to pause this video and view the first sub-module video from Dr. Ariel Cohen. To access this, you're going to need to utilize this URL, type it into a browser, and then play that YouTube video. When you're done, you come back and continue this one. Thank you. All right, hopefully you reviewed Dr. Ariel Cohen's first video uh, and are ready to continue. You might want to take a short break if you haven't already before continuing on in this module. Okay, so let's talk about the impact of hodograph length. That length for a given layer is related to the strength of the vertical shear through that layer. So in this example, the red hodograph represents a vertical shear of just about 20 knots, whereas the blue hodograph represents 70 knots of shear through that layer. The length of the hodograph is more relevant for convective mode than just the strength of the wind. This is why along the east coast of Florida, for example, on a hot summer day with mid-level flow only around 20 to 25 knots, onshore flow on the east side of a sea breeze boundary can locally increase hodograph length to represent 30 to 40 knots of vertical shear through the layer, even though wind speeds throughout the layer are 25 knots or less, as you see in this example. This can lead to supercells with hail and even brief tornadoes in what appears to be a weak flow environment, but it's not a weak shear one. So here's an example on a day that we saw supercells develop on the east side of sea breeze where we had enhanced onshore flow beneath moderate mid-level flow. On the right, we have three HER one-hour forecast hodographs from locations from central South Carolina at the top working southward to east central Georgia at the bottom for the same day and time. Note the difference in each hodograph shape. These changes in shape, be it due to small changes in wind direction or speed within shallow layers, or larger changes through a deeper layer, mean something in terms of what's happening in the troposphere. They also influence the pattern of storm relative flow vectors and how precipitation is distributed for a given storm or system. Changing the hodograph shape, particularly by adding inflections in different concavities, can affect the generation of perturbation pressure gradients as well as patterns of crosswise or streamwise vorticity. It's time to look at the second video from Dr. Ariel Cohen. So here's the URL to put into a browser and view this one. And then you can pause the video you're watching now and then return to it when you're done with Dr. Cohen's video. Thank you. Okay, you have completed Dr. Cohen's second video. His third video is coming up next, so you might want to take a short break before continuing. So on to the third video that deals with linear effects. Here's the URL, again, copy that or type that into your browser. And when you've completed that video, then come back to this one. Thanks. Okay, maybe time for another quick break before we continue. So now let's talk about the impact of changing storm relative flow. When you have different hodograph curvature and length, you can get different patterns of storm relative flow vectors with height, and that can influence precipitation distribution within a particular convective storm. The top image here shows an example with weak mid-level storm relative flow, but strong upper level storm relative flow. The middle example shows strong storm relative flow at all levels, as we typically see with a long, clockwise curved hodograph, while the bottom image 
shows a different hodograph configuration with strong low and upper level storm level flow, but very weak mid-level flow in this example. Each of these hodograph shapes means something different in terms of storm structure and precipitation orientation. As a mesoanalyst, it's important to try to be able to decipher this and understand how storms are going to develop on radar before radar shows its hand. So a key point is that as with other environment factors, vertical wind profiles can change considerably and rapidly in time and space, which can mean sharp and rapid changes to the hodograph. And it's important to pay attention to these changes. Here we have different wind profiles here going from south to north across the central part of Georgia for the same hour of the same day. You don't see a lot of significant differences in the hodograph, some changes in um, how much directional shear there might be, but they all show very strong speed shear. However, they do lead to very different shapes in the hodograph, different concavities. Some show favorable shapes for tornadoes, others show issues such as loops in the hodograph. You see, for example, the lower left having a loop within the inflow layer, which could have a different impact on the storm than having that loop further up in the upper part of the storm structure on the upper top image. So different shapes, different concavities can mean different end results. These changes are not coincidental. They mean something is going on in the troposphere. Okay, we've reached the final video from Dr. Cohen. So enter this URL in your browser and view that video and then return to this presentation to continue. Thanks. Okay, time for another break. This is a fairly lengthy module, but it has a lot of very important information. It's important to, have to take breaks from time to time, so take one here before completing the rest of the module. Now we're going to look at a case example to illustrate what we've covered. And this will be a late night case from November 30th of 2020. We have a strong upper trough that's moving quickly northeast across the southeastern United States. We have a north to south band of discrete storms and short segments that was forecast by the CAM models to develop, given a substantial angle of the deep layer shear vector to the surface trough in the band of storms. The high-res NAM revealed a low cape, high shear environment, typical across southern Georgia and northern Florida in the cool season. Despite SRH values above 300 meters squared per second squared, the model showed very weak updraft felicity tracks, with stronger ones off the southeastern North Carolina coast, primarily during the 6 to 12Z period, as you see here. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of uh, 9Z HER skew-tees and hodographs. We're going to start in central Georgia and work our way southward. Across central Georgia, we have very minimal cape, and it's basically above uh, a weak elevated, uh, and it's above a weak inversion, as you see, it's mostly elevated, weak instability. We have a very intense shear long hodograph, especially the whole red part of the hodograph is quite long. However, for an elevated storm above, say, uh, 900 millibars, much of that shear may not even be realized. We may be starting where the winds start to uh, back slightly in the upper part of the inflow layer, maybe actually be where the storms are based. And so we may not even see the intense low-level shear that you see on the hodograph. Further south, in the southern Georgia, much weaker inversion, but still one that appears to be there. Uh, again, a very long hodograph, especially the red part of the hodograph, the inflow layer, but some of that may not actually be realized if the storm inflow layer is elevated. Finally, as we look at northwestern Florida, a little different. Now we don't see much of an inversion at all. We have more substantial cape. We have a more ideal hodograph with winds veering and increasing steadily with height. No uh, loops or weaknesses in the hodograph, long hodograph shape, representing very strong shear. So a different environment in northwestern Florida than further north in Georgia. The CAMS guidance, as given in the left example, suggests a band of low top discrete storms or short line segments. And you can compare that to the KJAX radar image on the right to move quickly eastward across the area. 
But we note that the environment is different across south central Georgia compared to the northwestern part of the Florida Peninsula. Here we're zooming in on what looks like a somewhat discrete supercell within this band of storms close to the Florida Georgia border. You can have some rotation with that cell as well, as you can see highlighted here. Again, reflecting the different hodograph that supports capturing the entire low level shear, all that streamwise vorticity moved into this storm where we didn't see much in the way of rotation with cells further to the north. Here's a question. When you combine the photograph with the skew T, question, when the photograph is combined with the skew T information, it can help us to anticipate what about expected thunderstorms and choose all of the ones you think that apply here. I'll reveal the answer in a moment. Really, all of these can be anticipated with regard to what may occur with the storms given the storm environment. However, success of mesoanalysis, especially as you go down to the storm scale level, requires accurate data and interpretation. So here's a summary of our module. So as with the SKU-T, the hodograph is an important tool for the mesoanalyst for assessing what is happening. It can reveal clues that may be harder to assess just from looking at the vertical wind profile. Sometimes those clues are more subtle on the VWP. Changes in the photograph length and concavity, as well as changes in the storm motion vector, can influence convective structure, mode, and intensity. The amount of influence could relate, the amount of influence could relate to the level of instability and dynamic support for lift. Changes in the photograph can occur rapidly in time and space, and this is an important point. Even small changes to the wind profile can meaningfully impact what the photograph shows. Because of how sensitive photograph length and shape are to the wind profile, just small errors in model guidance will lead to errors in the forecast photograph. So QCing model data with available observational data is important for successful interpretation. The last part of this module is a learning assessment. And there'll be no audio for this part. I will show you questions followed by the answers. And if you want, you can pause the video for each question until you come up with the answer and then continue to reveal the answer for each question. Thank you.